Welcome to CPA Advisory Show. I'm your host, Jeremy Wells, CPA, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Chris Hervishan, CPA. Chris, how you doing? Best day ever. How are you? I am doing swell, thanks. Surviving through the extension deadline period. I hear that. Uh, just a few more days of that to go. We're so close, man. So close. Uh, man. All right. Um, and super excited uh, today to have a guest with us, uh, Alan Hettinger. Alan, uh, tell us about yourself and uh, what you're doing. Hey, so thanks a lot for having me. It's awesome to be on your show. Uh, my name's Alan Hedinger. I live in uh, Smyrna, which is a suburb of Atlanta, and um, former auditor. Uh, started my career in audit at a firm uh, called Bennett Thrasher here. Uh, spent four busy seasons doing that and uh, jumped over to the uh, industry side, moved into a controller position at a software company, um, and uh, have been doing that ever since, uh, since about 2019. So I have a, a, about uh, as many years working in um, accounting management as I do in uh, in audit at a firm. Just to kind of kick it off, because I'm super curious, but being in the software space, like what are your thoughts as far as where we are in the accounting industry and what's going on in the, in the SaaS space related to accounting and, and where do you think it's going? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I think that SaaS, uh, especially, so so I'm going to answer this from my perspective, uh, working working at a firm, doing audit. And um, there, there's a generational gap, I guess, is, is how I would characterize it. Um, you, you have uh, kind of the old schoolers who uh, have, have their way of doing things. And then they, you have kind of the new schoolers who see the potential of a lot of these SaaS tools um, that, are, that are implementing those. And uh, sometimes there's, there's a little friction between the two, but I think that um, both sides, uh, you know, ha have a valid argument. You know, the old schoolers that are, you know, used to the more manual approach to things. You, you definitely get down in the weeds. You get more hands-on with things. You probably develop a better understanding of things uh, than if you have some uh, uh, software tool um, doing everything for you. But, um, you know, on, on the other side of the coin, um, there's a lot of efficiency to be had with, uh, with SAS tools and, um, there's, there's a, uh, you know, a lot of value you can add by, by integrating those into, into your services for sure. Given where we are, where do you think that we're going? What will we be able to do? I mean, is, is software really going to be the solution that everybody thinks it is where uh, it's just going to be a bunch of bots, which is basically software just taking over the accounting space. Or is there going to be some sort of a happy medium where we eventually settle on? Just, just out of curiosity, as somebody who's, who's inside of a, a finance organization running a business, you know? Yeah. I mean, we are, we are not there yet where, you know, there's any threat to anyone's job, I think. Um, what I think is going to happen, and, and this is just my guess uh, based on what I've seen, is you're going to see things like low code, no code kind of skills become far more important. Um, and I say that because as someone who's worked with, um, you know, NetSuite, uh, Sage products, um, you know, all, all of the various accounting um, uh, suites you, you could possibly use. Um, you're using those, but you're also using a variety of other things. Maybe you're using bill.com. Maybe you're using, uh, like for example, we use Cvent to, uh, to handle event billing. Um, and accountants in a way, especially when you're working internally, you're, you're becoming a little bit of a systems integrator. Um, you're, you're making those systems talk to each other and maybe you still have to hire outside help to do that. Um, but maybe you can do it yourself. Maybe you uh, learn a little bit of code 
um, you know what this, you know, API is doing and you know what that API is doing and you can string the two together yourself. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's a really valuable skill because, um, you're, uh, you're essentially every time you you integrate something like that, you're you're kind of almost like adding a free employee to the company that's that's doing something for you. So, if I might, can we go down the rabbit hole a little bit for a minute? Yeah, because you mentioned no code and low code, and when I hear no code, what I really think about is something like a Zapier or or you know, Make, Integromat, you know, those sorts of tools. Power Automate would be another one. How are how are we defining? no code and low code. And that's the first piece. And then the second piece is, have you seen any candidates that have come to you with accounting backgrounds that also have these, these skill sets? And if so, do you think it's becoming more prevalent or is that something that you're even training your existing staff on to kind of get them into that, into that mode? Yeah. So to answer your second question first, um, I haven't, so I haven't done a lot of hiring, so I can't really answer that necessarily, but I think that, uh, I, I do work with people internally that have a lot of those, um, that have a lot of the knowledge, maybe they're not, um, doing the implementation themselves, but they, they can talk about it in a way where, um, you know, they, they can work with an outside party, you know, understand what they're doing, uh, a little bit better if you know if you're working with like stripe for credit card processing that's like an api um first sort of service um they understand that enough to understand that when you know when they hire someone you know what exactly are they doing so i do see that you know within the organization where i am right now um and then uh your what, what was the other part of your question remind me of that yeah, basically, how are we defining no code, low code? Like, what? And then, what are some examples of of that? Like, you know, I threw out Zapier, Integromat, Make, uh, Power Automate, those sorts of those sorts of tools. But there is some no code, low code automation that exists inside of platforms. You know, yeah. like I would argue that there's some of that even that exists inside of QBO. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think every time you do like a CSV import, you're talking about. Uh, you know, near, near low code, uh, sort of integration. Um, you know, that's, that's, I think everyone's entry point. I think that's probably the thing that most accountants are going to be familiar with is you get a CSV out of this system. You got to get it into that system. Uh, maybe you have to do some kind of transformation in between. Um, I consider that, uh, low code, no code, uh, sort of operation. Um, because you're not sitting there keying in every line. You're not looking at every line saying, hey, you know, here's, you know, here's my, uh, payroll. I'm going to punch this in. No, you're, you're, you're getting it out of ADP and you're, uh, you're maybe deleting some columns, adding some columns or doing some formula or something and then, uh, and then importing it. Um, so that's the, the most basic and simple, um, sort of integration you can do and then i think it's only uh it only goes up from there so that may be like the least automation but uh you're you're still covering a lot of ground by doing some kind of export import instead of um instead of uh keying keying stuff in or, or doing it on your 10 key and printing a receipt and <laughs> taping it to something and sticking it in a folder um uh, but yeah, and then I think, you know, maybe the, the step above that is your Zapier type, um, type integrations where, you know, Zapier kind of holds your hand. And then the next level above that is, is probably like a direct integration where you're literally writing software that's making the two systems talk to each other. Yeah. So thinking about, uh, integration among all these different accounting softwares we've got a, a bunch of different data going back and forth but um one of the things that i always see uh accountants who haven't bought into this kind of way of thinking like let's make these different programs talk to each other uh directly rather than you know something like you're saying an export import that kind of process um is security concerns right so where are we at in terms of uh having integrations because you know it's one thing to uh, make Stripe send an invoice into QBO, right? Like that, th those are two relatively benign pieces of information. It could be, I mean, Stripe's got some credit card data maybe, but not really anything that we could directly access, right? At least that's the idea. 
But then we get into something like maybe payroll software where there's actual, you know, employee data, or we get into something like tax software, you know, where there's social security numbers and birthdays and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, what are you, what are you coming up with is, you know, like the, the main thing that's really holding up the profession, right. In terms of pushing harder on, on these integrations and like, why are we not, why are we still having to do so many manual exports and imports? Yeah. You know, that that's that's a tough one. Um, I come into an organization and I see like, OK, well, you're using you're using five systems. Um, what's the solution to to simplify this? And everyone sits down, multiple meetings occur. Um, everyone gets together and, and uh, the upshot of of everything becomes, hey, we need system number six to uh to make all these things work together and what ends up happening is you don't end up going hard enough on system number six and that becomes the sixth thing that you now have to uh maintain and integrate and um it continues to grow from there um and i think that that may be uh, a, a fundamental mistake that um, maybe teams assume that they can uh, they can solve their solve their problems with one additional um, system, and when in reality maybe they need to use the systems they have better, or maybe they need to draw a, a harder line in the sand and um, say, okay, well if we do this one new thing, we should get rid of these two other things. And it should happen by this date or something, some kind of motivational uh, aspect to it. Now, that's an interesting point, right? Because um, yeah, I remember, uh, you know, back when I was taking courses, and this was not that long ago for me, since I'm relatively new to the field. But, um, you know, thinking about accounting information systems and in the in those audit, you know, those, those more advanced audit, you know, three, four thousand level audit courses where we're talking about the different technology and the different processes, really with the focus being on sort of an enterprise level. Right. So talking a lot about ERP software and that kind of stuff. Um, th this idea that you would just have one system, right? And and every, you know, that, that might be several different component systems. You might have your HR payroll system, your your general ledger system, you know, all these different uh, subsystems, right? But it was all one sort of big box solution with, it was sort of the textbook assumption that felt like, you know, it was there. But, you know, a lot of small business clients, that's not the case at all, right? They're not setting up an ERP and then running all of their invoicing, all of their payroll and, and you know, all of their GL functions through that. They have to have these different, uh, you know, 10, 20, $50 a month products that all talk to each other rather than one, mm -hmm. you know, $100,000 a year sort of product running all of that. So on the, on the small business side, though, we do have some options out there you know, QuickBooks Online, right? QuickBooks Online wants to be sort of that ERP for, you know, a small business. They want to do your invoicing and your payroll and your GL and all of these things. But then there's pushback, right? Like we don't want one entity into it to have all the data. We don't want to rely completely on them. So, you know, where's the balance between, like you said, we've got five systems. We need to add a six to make those five talk to each other. And now we've actually just got six systems, right? We, we've increased our load by 20%, right? Instead of actually reducing the load here versus let's dump all of our eggs into one basket and just have one system that, you know, is sort of running everything. Like how, you know, thinking from a, from an enterprise perspective, from a small business perspective, from the perspective of, you know, the, the CPA who's got to run all this stuff for a lot of our clients, right? Mm -hmm. Like where do we find the right balance? So I think when you're thinking about moving from, say, like a QuickBooks Online to a NetSuite system or something like that, um, you're you're not necessarily deciding to jump from um, QuickBooks and plus you know ten other ten other systems that you're using to um, NetSuite. You're probably thinking more about the um, well, maybe maybe you are thinking about NetSuite, but. In, in reality, what you're putting in place is probably like a consulting firm that's going to uh, create that system for you, whether it's NetSuite or Sage Intact. And um, I think that that's really the more important con component 
of making that decision because uh, NetSuite, Sage Intact, these are more, um, I think of them more as platforms than as uh, accounting systems or as, as software. They're platforms, they're building blocks that your consulting firm is going to put together for your company to to integrate and kind of handle as much as humanly possible um, your your day to day stuff. So it's going to start off with deep dives into all of your processes, and it's going to go from there. They're they're going to start thinking, okay, well, these are the components that you should probably have for your company, you know, from from our uh, from our platform. These are the things we should we should put together. Um, these are the permissions that the various uh, people and, you know, the, these are the permissions the controller should have, the AR clerk should have um, within the system. Um, these are like the dashboards that everyone should, should be able to see. Um, and uh, NetSuite and Intact and things like that, you know, they're, they're perfectly capable of doing that. Um, but I, I think that those that move can end up being a little bit of a trap for um, for some companies. So companies will see that um, that move as we're you know we're just getting new software and the software is going to solve all our problems and the the consulting firm is a uh, is a little bit maybe not an afterthought but um, you know not not the primary thing. Um, maybe that's not the best way to think about something like a, like a major move from, from like a QuickBooks online to, to something like that. Um, because, uh, you, you move to, you move to like NetSuite and it doesn't solve all your problems and, um, you, you need a literal engineer to, um, to make it solve additional problems for you. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, that's, it's not this, it's not the sort of thing where a, it, it, it's this, uh, you know, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna integrate everything, everything myself. <laughs> um, it's just such a, such a complicated system. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that would be, that would be what I would um, look for specifically if you're, if you're thinking about a move like that is, is a, a, a agency that you really click with a consulting firm you really click with. That's gonna, that's gonna help you make that move. And um, really, you know, in, improve the efficiency of your back office to um, to make that happen for you. I'm going to ask a similar question that's potentially the same question in a different way, but <clears throat> there seems to be two approaches to, to this decision. One is we're going to, or at least attempt to lump all of these different functions onto one platform. And then the other approach would be, we are going to take the best of breed uh, pieces and then try to stitch them together in some way in order to accomplish all the different functions that we're looking at. I'm wondering where you kind of fall on that, on that spectrum. Are you a best of breed for the function guy or are you a platform guy? Uh, so I, I am probably more of a best of breed for the function guy because I like to do stuff myself. <laughs> um, I like things that I can work with. So uh, yeah, just forget everything I just said about NetSuite. No, um, I, I think that you know, QuickBooks Online is an amazing piece of software. Um, when you think about like how it handles bank feeds and stuff like that, uh, you know, it, NetSuite, you're, you're going to pay 10, maybe more times as much for, and it, it can't even do something out of the box like that. It's crazy. Um, so there's there's certainly something to be said for, you know, taking QuickBooks Online, taking, uh, you know, five or six other uh, SaaS products, stitching them together in a way that works for you um, and and making that work. And then it, it kind of becomes a question of, do you, do you have the ability, um, you know, whether it's a, whether you know, that's outside or inside your organization to make these systems work together? Um, so, you know, I, I have certainly done a lot of uh, a lot of both, um, working uh, at uh, startups that didn't even have an um, an accounting function before I joined, to uh, you know being being acquired by a company that that had been 
you know, uh, using using these more enterprise systems for for several years. And um, it's just it's just funny. I mean, I think that you you maybe imagine the 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 bigger, more mature companies, you know, is you know they they've got everything worked out and um, it's it's all engineered and, and perfect. But it it's really you know it's uh, it's a bigger ship, but just as complex. And uh, there uh, sometimes is just as much chaos going on behind the scenes with their uh, software. So I, I fall in the same boat, and I make the argument all the time that like the GL is the hub of all of the things that the business operates on, and that's just being a totally biased accountant when you're talking to small business owners who really don't <laughs> care about accounting. They just want numbers and stuff like that. Right. But <clears throat> I think, I think your last point is an interesting segue into kind of the M and a world. So if, if you're an accountant, who's at a startup, how much of that situation influences your answer to the last question? In other words, are you thinking about, are you still in that kind of best of breed mode or are you thinking about well a likely acquirer is going to use these platforms and you know maybe we should be thinking about that a little bit earlier than we would otherwise yeah if i'm at a startup and uh, especially if the owners are starting to think about selling the company um i'm thinking about one timeline um and and then two you know based on our timeline what what can we possibly get done and so my answer would uh, would vary depending on on what that timeline is. So if if uh, if if you're at a startup and the the timeline is, hey, we're we want to go to market in like three months, um, <laughs> you're not going to implement a NetSuite or or something more advanced uh, it, that's that's going to really make a difference or move the needle. Um, if you have several years then um, you you probably do want to get into a system like that um, just just for the sake of getting it uh, getting it implemented and um, you know having having better better reporting throughout the uh, throughout the years as as you approach that that time where you're going to go to market um, the uh, the system itself is very likely to get tossed out the window um, once uh, once you get to some kind of transaction. Um, you know, maybe there's a good chance that it's just going to be, you know, there's going to be another company involved um, and uh, you're, you're just going to transition everything to their accounting software. Um, but if they're uh, in the time in between, um, what, what you really want is you want the ability to really consistently report your um, financials. You you want processes in place that are going to ensure that your revenue, expenses, everything you know, you can you can spit out any financial report that uh, that is needed throughout the process. So um, again, just uh, first you want to start with that timeline and think about what what can I accomplish. Um, it's not just going to affect what you do going forward too. Um, usually if you're in a position to where you may be ac acquired, you're, you're looking back the last three years and you're saying, Oh man, this company, they didn't even have an accountant the last three years. And now we need to, uh, you know, put their, <laughs> put their, put their financials into some kind of monthly format that people are going to understand. Um, and, uh, that's, that's a big, uh, that's a big project. Um, and that is probably going to happen in Excel. Um, you know, you're probably not going to get all that, uh, software is probably not going to be a big help to you there. In those cases, what do you see startups doing? Like when they're in that weird sort of phase between it's starting to pick up and they, they know they need to do better, but they're just you know, they're not prepared for that yet. They haven't brought on, you know, a CFO or controller, or even a tax person, right? You know, they, they, they're just kind of in that mode of, well, we've never really made enough money to worry about it. Now, all of a sudden, money's coming in and they need to worry about it, right? <laughs> like, what 
what do you usually see them cobbling together to make it work, right? Like when I pick up a small business client, they usually come to me and they like they they've set up a Stripe account and maybe if I'm lucky they set up a separate business bank account, right? And like that's what <laughs> that's that's their their tech stack at that point. You know, what what do you usually see in the startup world, you know, the ones that you've worked with? Where have they gotten to before they realize Oh, we need somebody's help with this. Mm -hmm. And then what are you doing to to get them into a proper tech stack? Yeah, so I'll back up first and I'll talk about just my experience uh with the the companies that I have experience with because I'm I'm approaching this for, as as an internal guy. So when I first left uh Bennett Thrasher my accounting firm, I I joined a company. Uh the guy called me out of the blue and he said, "Um uh, hey, we're we're growing. I've got a business that's growing, and uh, we don't have an accountant, and we have some tax compliance issues. Um, they didn't they didn't mention anything about them necessarily wanting to sell the company, um, but he he said, hey, we're growing. We we probably should have an internal accountant. We've had an external person, um, and uh, that's you know that's that's getting some of that's getting us some of the way, but not not all the way where we want to be. So. Um, I, I asked how the company was doing. I wanted to <laughs> like, hey, is this company profitable? Are they making revenue before I joined them? And I, uh, I, after he told me, I was like, okay, you know that you guys are you guys are doing pretty awesome. I'll, I'll uh, jump over, uh, jump over there. Um, and it's funny um, this this played out. This has played out twice uh, so far for me, where the company is is doing their uh, they're, they're judging by their performance by looking at their bank account. Um, you know, how much cash is in our bank account? We were doing great. You know, there's, there's not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of forecasts. There's not a lot of timing, um, you know, like you would have in, in accrual accounting where you can kind of really understand was this month profitable or not. Um, and, uh, that's a big leap going from that, um, you know, bank account, no, no financial uh, uh, processes whatsoever to uh, to having like a monthly reporting um, process. And um, what I've done, uh, what I've done in those cases is um, you, you've got to look at the processes that they have, if if there are any at all, and you have to kind of think of also maybe the ideal, <laughs> like the the perfect processes. And um, you you have to implement as much as you can in the time uh, in the time that you have. Um, and you know, the, there's 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 a lot of um, there's a lot of knowledge and um, uh, like intelligence kind of baked into a company's processes, even if they're not you know perfect. There tends to be a lot of knowledge and uh, and intelligence baked into their processes because it they were born out of okay we're, we're working with these customers we're working with these vendors and um they're they're born out of that and so you can't come in with a sledgehammer and say okay this is how we're going to do things going forward you have to come in um with a scalpel and uh, adjust the processes so that they will they'll continue to work for the company um, but they'll also work for the, your, your reporting needs. Um, so, so, I mean, that's, that's what I've, that's what I've done in, in these, in the transactions that I've been involved in. Um, I've, I've, I've come in, uh, you know, you, you, you have to be a little bit delicate. You have to be a little bit, um, you have to, you have to also bring your knowledge and understanding, um, and, and, you know, steer that ship um, to, uh, to the, the goals that you're trying to achieve. So how soon in the process would you ask about timeline? Would you, I mean, would that be your first question or is that something that you would ask as you're kind of going through the, the whole process of just getting your feet wet and understanding the business and understanding the processes and things like that? Yeah, it would be one of my first questions. I would say, you know, is there one, is there any, um, desire to go through an M&A process? Um, and two, if there is, you know, what, what timeline are you looking at? Because again, that's just going to drive so much, you know, are, are, if, if in the shortest timeline, it's going to happen in Excel 
in the longest timeline, maybe it's a transition to uh, to an enterprise system. Um, and so it would definitely be one of my first questions. Um, if they if if uh, it's a company that's uh, you know just they're they're looking for your standard bookkeeping um, services, there's there's no mention of that. Then um, you know maybe maybe that's not a concern. But I mean that's that's a unique thing to to want to go through go through a transaction. Um, but it's it's also pretty it's it's becoming a more common thing, um, especially twenty twenty two, uh, very uh, <laughs> very common thing. What's the role of the accountant, the the CPA in an M and A transaction? I, I've never done one. I don't you know I I, I took a, a a half credit M and A course and we spent five weeks just writing up the journal entries, um, and it felt <laughs> felt a little academic, right? So yeah. you know it, it, it just, you know and and the ultimate goal was to figure out how much goodwill to put on the acquiring company's balance sheet, right? Like that that was my. Uh, you know, M and A education, but you know, obviously, this this could be a, a drawn out process. There's a lot of preparation. There's got to be some negotiation. Like, what is the what is the CPA's role in an M and A transaction? What does that look like? Yeah, as as uh, the CPA or the controller, or if you're, um, I imagine if if you're in client accounting services and you are you're going to be become the point person in some way and in a process like that you are the um you're really at the heart of everything um they they're going to kick off a process that involves lots of different parties it's going to involve every department of the company it's going to involve lawyers outside accountants um, bankers buyers and um you're going to be cc'd on every single email you're going to see every list of uh list of requests um because uh when that um when that due diligence starts happening you know probably 80% of the due diligence requests are going to be um financial uh items so um i i think that backing up though before a process like that begins um a uh, owner may start talking to may start talking to bankers or may start thinking about uh, I should hire a, a banker, which is kind of like a broker, almost like a real estate agent to sell your sell your company. Um, but if they want to work with a good banking firm, um, they those banking firms can be pretty selective too. Um, they may look at the company and say, we don't, we can't even understand what's going on with this company because they can't give us a, a P&L that we uh, can rely on or understand. Um, so you, you become pretty central, pretty important really early on in that process to even just find a, a banking firm. Um, and then once, uh, once they do have a hold of you, they they're going to want to leverage you as much as possible because they have limited time to um, uh, to put into kind of the nuts and bolts of the deal. They they you know their their biggest value I think is their um, their connections and their their experience uh, working through transactions. Um, and so they're going to want to want to rely on you as much as possible to provide um confidence that the um that the numbers are are legitimate um buyers uh, uh, you know the bigger the buyer is especially if there's like a major private equity firm involved or they're just like a public company or something like that they're going to have a really uh, sophisticated due diligence process because they're going to want to be um they want to they would rather spend money combing through everything than uh and spend money buying a, a company that ends up not being an awesome company um, or, or not being what they what they expected. And um, I think that the the CPA, whoever's whoever's kind of driving the financial side of that, you're, you're such an integral part of um, driving that confidence. So I mean, I think that your role almost spills over a little bit into um, a, a sales role. Because not only are you like, hey, you know, this this startup, uh, um, here's here's their financials, but you, you're you're providing um, support and um, uh, 
uh, commentary around uh, those those numbers so that everyone can understand um, what's going on. So when we're thinking about a timeline for an acquisition and we're asking the question and we're getting that kind of sense in the back of our mind and we're talking about putting systems in place and processes in place and people in place and we understand that we're going to be the point person for some sort of a deal. What are some of the things that we should be thinking about proactively that we may need to provide it apart from the obvious, which are going to be financial statements, right? But what is, what's some of the financial information that we should be thinking about that we're going to need to cobble together at some point we should have readily available when we're talking about the processes and the systems and things like that? Yeah. So I think one statement that may be overlooked a little bit sometimes is, is your, is your cash flows. Um, so that's, that tends to drive valuation a lot um, is, is the, the statement of cash flows. And so if, if you're just doing like a P and L and a balance sheet and there's no um, there's no like uh, statement of cash flows, then they're going to ask for that <laughs> because that, that may, that may end up being a key to their um, valuation. The other big, big piece of this is um, KPIs, especially for SaaS companies. Um, especially for any business that is uh, subscription based um they're going to want to know it, what's your churn what is your um ac customer acquisition cost um they they're they're going to want to see you know historical information on that forecasts on that um and it's a it's a funny thing because it's not uh, financial information um, and it's not something that I think anyone really, if you went to, you know, if, if your focus was accounting in, in school, um, it's not necessarily anything that you learn a lot about. But uh, that that sort of stuff is going to get drilled into deep. Um, and it's, it's not financial information, but you almost have to treat it um, with the same level of respect as, as you would your um, your revenue numbers because um, that that's going to drive their understanding of the company and uh, they're just going to ask a, a million questions about that um, about that kind of stuff. It's going to vary by industry. So uh, for a software subscription based software, you're going to have the, um, the the churn is going to be a big question. But you know if you're manufacturing, um, you know there may be there may be other in questions about inventory, things like that. Um, but uh, definitely develop a strong understanding of what are the key uh, performance indicators for your industry or for your client's industry. Get those locked down, um, historically present, forecasted, and um, make sure you're ready to uh, talk about them and provide color commentary for them. Yeah, so in the process of uh, leading up to that, right? So before we're even thinking about acquisition, right? You know, we, we, we're just, we're just starting up and building the company. What, you know, based on your experience, what can founders be doing, you know, six months, 12 months, 18 months before they even really get big enough to start thinking about being acquired? You know, what do they need to start doing from, from almost from day one to set themselves up for maybe a successful acquisition, whether, you know, even if it's a year, three years, five years out, like what, what becomes deal breakers in these kinds of things that, oh, if only we thought of that, like when we were first getting started, it would have been helpful, right? Like what, what are some deal breakers you've seen or what are some things that like, yeah, if we just, if we just work to improve that figure or that KPI a little bit more, maybe this would have been an easier process. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to, um, uh, say that like a something's going to be a deal breaker um, that that was a genuine um, uh, like a genuine shortcoming of the business itself, um, right? Like if if the business isn't growing at a certain pace, or their churn is too high, or their expenses they're they as they grow they're becoming less and less profitable. Um, if there's there's a genuine shortcoming there um no amount of no amount of reporting is gonna is gonna help that um but you know if they if they had good reporting all along um maybe they could have identified that kind of thing earlier and 
made some adjustments to to how they're growing the company or what they're focusing on um to to uh make that work um i'll, I'll give you uh an example is uh you know I, I was at a company they had a they had a core product that was just doing awesome um very profitable uh you know just a running great and i think that um perhaps the owners got a little bored working on that um and they wanted to work on something else and uh they were putting a lot of uh resources into a new product that was not yet profitable um it could have been in a, at a future at a future date um but you know bad time to put a lot of resources into something that is not profitable when you're also uh deep into a uh into a M&A process so um if 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 uh if you take a step back and say okay well you know maybe maybe we should uh we should focus focus on profitability of the company rather than um you know take this left turn into into some new uh line um that, you know that that may have been a good decision that um drove better better profitability and just made the company look a little bit better uh as as they as they went through the process so um the the same tools that a buyer's going to use to value the company i think that the owner should probably using be using those tools to um make decisions about the company themselves and um if if there's some industry standard uh, KPIs, you know they're not just a they're not just a sales tool. They are uh, they're a great management tool. Um, so uh, for sure, understand what's going on there. Um, make uh, make decisions about uh, make decisions based on them, and uh, drive you know l- let that drive your decision making process. So where in that process or where in that journey would you say we need to start developing those KPIs or where would we start even even looking for those? Is it industry benchmarking? Is it, you know, we're all going to huddle a team in a room and just hammer it out and, and figure it out? Or is it is it somewhere in between? Like, what, what does that process look like? And what's the timing of when you'd say that that really needs to get started? Yeah, probably not. If you're, you know, if, if you're if you're with a startup and maybe they have like, you know, less than 10 customers or something, they're still figuring out their product market fit and, and things like that. Um, you, you don't really have a lot of that, you know, your, your, your churn, you know, things like that, probably not going to be super, super relevant. But as soon as you start hitting that stride where you've, you've got a little bit of, you've got a mature product, you've got a sales process um, that's working, You've got customers coming in the door and, um, you know, the, the machinery is starting to turn um, at that startup. Um, as, as soon as you've got a, you're, you're transitioning from that, um, from that more exploratory phase of a startup to, uh, to, to a functioning company with a mature product, um, you really should probably get those get those KPIs figured out at that at that point. Um, I'm I'm not going to say you have to have them from day one, um, but you know probably the earlier on um, the better uh, because it's just going to help you understand your your own company uh, your own company a little bit better. So let's think about this uh, for those who might be new to the profession or uh, thinking about coming into the profession. So you've worked for a firm and you've also worked for corporate in a couple of these different transactions. So what what's the difference, right? For somebody who's not, you know, taking a job yet or is thinking about comparing jobs, you know, we you, pretty much your choices are go work for somebody else's firm try to bootstrap your own or, or go work in corporate, right? Like what, what goes in, what should be going through the mind of a new candidate, a new CPA candidate, right? A new accounting graduate 
what should they be looking for and, and how should they be thinking about making that decision about, you know, what job offers to accept or where to apply or those kinds of things, you know, really thinking about firm versus corporate from your experience, like what would you recommend they think about, look at, ask about? Yeah. So I was super happy with my decision to start at a, start an accounting firm. Um, even though I, decided eventually that I didn't want to, you know, if, if you don't want to make a partner at a firm like that, then, uh, you know, you kind of start asking yourself, why do I, why am I going to put myself through all this stress of the busy season and everything? Um, but if you, if you start there, uh, you, there's a lot of benefits to it. Um, one, you'll probably get exposure to a lot of different industries. You, you'll go into so many different offices. I mean, as an auditor, I went into um, a lot of software companies. I also went out and um, did inventory counts on literal steel beams. <laughs> so, you know, very, very industrial manufacturing type of uh, experience. Um, and you just, you learn how lots of different offices operate. Um, you interact with all kinds of different people. Um, and you, you start building a network, you, you know, within your firm itself and with the companies that you're working with, um, just an awesome, awesome way to kick off your career. I think, um, hard, hard to replicate that experience. If you, um, are, if you go straight into like a corporation, um, and, uh, you know, I, that, that wasn't the way I did it. So I can't speak to like how how that would be. Um, but I think that, um, uh, you know, there's, there's just, there's, there's a lot of benefits to, to doing that firm, um, firm experience. And, um, then on the other hand, you know, if, if you, if you decide that that life is not for you, um, uh, or if you, you start an audit and you want to switch to tax or anything like that, you're, uh, you're not locked in, for life into into what you what you decide to do um, to start, and I think that people probably feel a lot of pressure. You know, if you're coming out of school, you're starting to uh, starting to enter the job market, and you're like, "Oh, this is this is like the most fundamental decision of my life." <laughs> it's not. Um, you you can you can change your mind. Um, you you can go do uh, something else. It's not the end of the world. So firm first, and that's kind of how I started myself. So. I totally hear you on that one. I'm curious what you'd say as far as weighing firm size, big four, small firm, regional firm, that, that sort of thing, and how that advice would, would shift. Yeah, so I had, a, I had an opportunity to join um, Deloitte. Uh, and uh, when, when I was looking for my first job, and uh, I also had, a, had an opportunity at this smaller regional firm, Bennett Thrasher, I made the decision based on my my personal situation i was we we're starting to think about having kids things like that um and i said okay well the, the hours are going to be a little bit a little bit shorter um that kind of thing but that wasn't the only factor um i thought about the kind of businesses that i wanted to work with and i love working with the um kind of founder owned startups um the the smaller companies um and big four firms don't really do that you you go to a um, Chris, I don't know what you're, what, well, let, before I answer this, let me ask you, so were you big four or were you like a regional firm, um, before you started your, I own? was, I, yeah, I would say I was technically neither. So I started out in forensic accounting and that was with an inter international firm, but it was in a small office that basically operated as its own firm. Re okay. Realistically. Yeah. And then I went from there to super big corporate to smaller corporate that turned into big corporate. And I started my, the firm that I have now as a side hustle. And eventually after operating that for a number of years, just figured out, you know, why am I here in corporate? <laughs> and now, now I'm, now I'm literally here, <laughs> you know, I'm operating yeah. my own firm. So that's kind of how it went for me. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, 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 I saw, I don't, I don't, I don't want to offend anyone, but I saw the big four experience. You as, can't offend anybody here. Okay. <laughs> I saw the big four experience as a, um, you know, here you're going to audit Coca-Cola, like, you know, here's an Atlanta company. You're going to audit Coca-Cola and you're going to audit their accounts payable. Um, 
and that's all you're going to do. You're going to have this very narrow focus on a very big company. Um, and that is not the sort of um, experience I, I really wanted to get, even though, I mean, there, sure, there's, uh, um, you know, you get to put that gold star on your on your resume of, the, of, of being at the big four. Um, that's certainly a consideration. It still gets you a lot of respect for sure. Um, but uh, that's not the kind of thing I wanted to do at, at, at my regional firm. I was talking to business owners. I was looking at all different parts of the company. Um, and that was a lot more interesting to me. And if, uh, if, if you have a, uh, a situation or professors are pushing you to, you know, go big four, go big four, like that recruiting train is, is running all to, to all big four, you know, that's, that's something to, to certainly consider. hundred percent. Well, Alan, this has been a, a really wide ranging conversation. Yeah. We definitely appreciate your time today. I think, I mean, there's a lot in here, I think for newer people coming into the profession and certainly for people who are in, um, in corporate and going through potentially some M and A or thinking about building out a, building out a corporate finance function from scratch. And I think there's a lot in here for advisors too, as far as you know, the things to think about in the M&A process and where to get started. There's just a ton of co great content in here. So we definitely appreciate appreciate that and appreciate your time. Jeremy, you want to wrap us up and fill us in on some key takeaways? Yeah, I, I like you were saying, Chris, the, the, the longer I'm in this game and the more I'm thinking about these parts of accounting that I haven't really had to do on my own and M&A is, is a big one of those, the, the more I'm realizing that uh, a lot of these things are just you know, run good businesses, right? And and these other sort of functions will kind of take care of themselves, right? Um, and you know, whether whether that's tax planning and strategy, or or you know, M and A work, or uh, you know, just whatever it is you're trying to accomplish with your business, right? If you have those sort of foundational aspects of a good business, right, um, then it's going to make uh, things down the road much. Uh, much easier for you. Alan, it's been uh, fantastic having you and I appreciate you sharing your experiences with us. This is a, this is an aspect of the industry that we haven't talked about yet on this show. Um, mm -hmm. You know, 20, 20 episodes ish in um, and, you know, we, we've, we've spoken to some people about auditing. We've spoken to some people from corporate, but this is the first time we really had uh, someone come on and talk about the experience of going through these kinds of transactions and doing this kind of work for corporations. So really appreciate you coming on and sharing these experiences with us. Yeah, you guys have had a lot of great guests. I listened to several episodes and uh, I was I was humbled to uh, join your podcast for sure. Um, and it's been a pleasure speaking with you both and being a part of it. Excellent. Thanks, Alan. And thank you, Chris. And as always, this has been the CPA Advisory Show. Thanks for listening. Hey, it's Jeremy. Thanks for watching the CPA Advisory Show here on YouTube. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, like, and leave us a comment. We'll probably read your comment on the air. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at CPA Advisory Show. And if you have an idea for a topic or guest you'd like to see, email us at host at CPA Advisory Show.com. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.